What you can't just fake or rip out is stuff like file system APIs. So uh, I'm curious about what about libuv? What about the dependencies of Node? So what about like OpenSSL? What about things like that? Is that part of what you had to compile down to WebAssembly as well? Those all actually have different answers. Big thanks to our partners, Linode, Fastly, and LaunchDarkly. We love Linode. They keep it fast and simple. Check them out at linode.com slash changelog. Our bandwidth is provided by Fastly. Learn more at fastly.com and get your feature flags powered by LaunchDarkly. Get a demo at launchdarkly.com. This episode is brought to you by Retool. Retool is a low-code platform built specifically for developers that makes it fast and easy to build internal tools. Instead of building internal tools from scratch, the world's best teams, from startups to Fortune 500s, are using Retool to build their internal apps. Assemble your app in 30 seconds by dragging and dropping from the complete set of powerful pre-built components. From there, you write custom code, connect any data source, API, and build custom logic and queries to create exactly the right tools for your business. Spend your time getting UI in front of your stakeholders, not hunting down the best React table library. Retool is also highly hackable, so you're never limited by what's available out of the box. If you can write it in JavaScript and an API, you can build it in Retool. Try Retool out for yourself at retool.com slash changelog. Again, retool.com slash changelog. This is JS Party, your weekly celebration of JavaScript and the web. We record live on YouTube each and every Thursday at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern. Subscribe to our channel for notifications at youtube.com slash changelog. And join in the conversation on Twitter. We are at JS Party FM. Okay, let's get right into it. Hey, it's party time, y'all. Welcome back, one and all, to another episode of JS Party. We have an exciting show for you today. Now, admittedly, I say that every episode, but I really, truly mean it this time. Jared's excited. Because we are joined by Eric Simons from Stackblitz. Stackblitz recently made waves with a huge announcement, I think around May 21st, in conjunction with Google I.O., about this new technology they've been working on to help us run Node.js in our browsers natively. So we'll talk about what all that means. First of all, Eric, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here with you all. And we also have longtime contributor, but not recent contributor. Hey, it's Christopher Boneskull. Hiller, Chris, you're back. I am, I think. Here I am, I think. From outer space. Yeah. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. And K-Ball's here. What's up, K-Ball? Hey, hey. Glad to be here. So let's start by getting excited and then we'll talk about technology and maybe we'll dig in. Maybe we'll get less excited. Maybe we'll get more excited. We'll see what happens throughout the show. I don't really get excited. All right. So just be quiet over there, Chris. Challenge accepted. Excited. Okay. <laughs> Eric, if you can get Chris excited by the end of the show, you're pretty much can just raise another round of funding probably immediately. <laughs> Deal. That sounds good. All right. Let's do it. So the announcement was web containers which, like I said in the opening, lets us run Node.js natively in the browser. So we'll dig into like how it works and how you're building this, and we'll talk future. But let's just start off with like what does it mean when you all say natively, Node natively in the browser? Tell us what that means. Yeah, I mean, it's essentially running you know, a direct you know, API parity version of Node in your browser. It's actually taking, we've written this tool chain that'll take Node.js, the source code itself, build from source, and actually pull it out. And I guess, let me take a step back. When you look at Node.js, if you've you know, kind of dug into the how Node.js works, you know, when you require the FS module, the first thing that it does is you're actually touching JavaScript code. Like the Node's uh, built-in packages are just JavaScript code, right? But they inevitably have to pass over into uh, native code on, on your local machine. It's like with C++ and that sort of thing, right? So essentially what we've done at a very high level, right, is the JavaScript stuff will just work, you know, browsers can run JavaScript, right? But how do you run C++ in a browser? Well, you convert it to WebAssembly, right? So at a very high level, what we've done here is the parts of Node.js that punch into your native operating system for access like file system, networking, et cetera, 
we've written a WebAssembly operating system layer that actually provides those surfaces, right? But it's actually, if you go in and inspect source on it uh, and compare the, you know, the Node.js runtime code against, I think right now we've support Node 14.6 or something like that. Compare that against raw source, it's one-to-one, right? So it's actually Node.js itself. So when you're doing that, when you're running Node's JavaScript, like Node packages up an implementation of V8 that is, yep. it compiles. Are you running using that packaged V8 code running as WebAssembly, or are you cutting straight through to the browser's version of the JavaScript interpreter? Yeah, really good question. So this comes down to like, how is it so fast? If you rewind back to the origin of Node.js itself, you know, the web is awesome. Like, you know, JavaScript is awesome. We wanted to use it to build stuff, not just on the web. We wanted to use it to build local applications, right? And, you know, browsers, though, have to be really secure. They have to be really fast. And so to add APIs that expand capabilities take time to do right because the blast radius is really large. Anytime you open a browser tab, you're downloading and executing code. So Ryan Dahl, the fastest path to bring JavaScript to local was to pull V8 out of Chrome, right? And bring it to local. But we had this divergence where now when you run a local tool chain, you are running multiple copies of V8. You're running every node process has its own copy of V8 running. And usually there's you know a dozen processes when you're doing dev or something. If you're using VS Code or Atom or whatever, that's Chrome. It's Chromium, right, for Electron. So you're running another copy of V8 in that thing. And then you're previewing your app in Chrome itself or whatever, and that's another copy of it. So you have like, you know, dozens of independent copies of V8 running, which is a huge inefficiency. And so the key insight we had is that, you know, you can actually yield much better performance and security by kind of, you know, converging all these things that have diverged over the past decade and use the single copy of V8 in Chrome, right? It's a lot faster. It's more secure. That version of V8 is evergreen. If you install Node 10 or whatever, that version of V8 is out of date. There have been security fixes that have been shipped for it, right? So by actually leveraging what's in your browser, you get all the benefits of the fact that Google is investing, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars into making this the most secure runtime on the planet. So at a technical level, that's the long answer to, yeah, absolutely, right? So this is actually a really big deal because what makes our local tool chains really insecure is that we had to diverge from being able to run this stuff in a browser and just leveraging the existing engine to bring it to local 10 years ago. And now we're bringing it back and, you know, kind of completing the loop there. So to make sure I understand what you're saying is that any JavaScript that's being executed is actually being run by the browser's version of V8. And Correct. you're then essentially providing any of Node's like library functions that happen to be implemented in C++ as available in WebAssembly? Yeah, more or less. And I think there's, there's parts of what V8 does, right? Like there's certain things that we have to port that we don't have access to the V8 API in a browser as, as you know, for security reasons, right? But there are things that we can actually pull out and make run independently in a browser to provide that same sort of functionality. So essentially you lean on the existing uh, V8 APIs available in a browser or any browser engine for that matter, or you, you know, for things that you can't do, they're a bit more lower level, you port them over in WebAssembly and actually use that as the target runtime there. So there's a ton of C++ code in Node.js that talks directly to V8 then. And if you're running this in WebAssembly, you don't have access to those APIs. That's what you're saying? Out of the box, yeah. And this is kind of what took a long time for us to get right is creating interfaces that, like operating system interfaces, where we could compile out the parts where Node.js does touch native into something that could run as in WebAssembly on top of a WebAssembly operating system, if that makes sense. Do you follow that, Chris? You look confused. No. So, okay. So in Node C++, there are all these calls to V8, directly to V8. This is why like the, the Node Chakra project was like a big effort and, and they wanted to, to be able to decouple Node from V8. But that lost steam. It was like a big undertaking, right? Yeah. And so did you like have to go in there and patch node to actually rip out those calls or did you create like an adapter that would say in the operating system or i don't even know where exactly but node would get these v8 apis from something that pretends to be v8 do you know what i'm saying yeah yeah totally yeah it's a bit of both right so and, and we're and you know there's still a lot of things that we're doing r d on this front but the short of it, in certain places, it doesn't make sense for those to call out to V8, right? Because if you're trying to, 
you know, create a new date object. And I just, just an absolutely arbitrary example, right? But like right. your browser can do that really well, <laughs> right? Like in those cases, we'll just short circuit it and actually just leverage the existing stuff that the browser comes with. And there's a lot of things that you can do that with, right? There are more lower level things though, like file system calls and things like that, where people have tried to do this before, right? Where they take polyfills and they're like, we're going to polyfill kind of the surfaces. And the problem is that the runtime of Node is pretty specific in ways that aren't even like, they're incidental. It's not standardized, it's incidental. And people have built on top of that now. So it's not just a matter of having all the APIs, it's you kind of need the real thing to run, right? Or at least in the exact same way it went on local. You're hitting the nail on the head. This is exactly the big challenge in doing something like this. Where do you draw the line, you know, on do we port this to go into WebAssembly or do we kind of swap it out for something that's going to be leverage the browser's native capabilities? Sure, right. So those V8 calls, yeah, maybe Node is creating a JavaScript object, but it's doing it in C++ and that's what it needs a V8 for, right? So you can rip that out and you can actually just have JavaScript do it, right? Because there you go. We already have a V8 running in a browser. Mm -hmm. What you can't just fake or rip out is, yeah, stuff like file system APIs, things like, so I'm curious about what about LibUV? What about the dependencies of Node? So what about like OpenSSL? What about things like that? Is that part of what you had to compile down to WebAssembly as well? Those all actually have different answers, but like something like LiveUV, right, is, you know, again, browsers have a built-in event loop implementation. You know, kind of, if you look across, you know, I mean, obviously all of them do, right? Like it's, it's kind of a key part of making JavaScript work, but so being able to kind of leverage the existing event loops that your browsers have, that's one thing where you can drop LiveUV as something that's got to be compiled, right? I think one of the key things, right, that we did that there was not any you know, prior art on, right, is actually getting a full TCP networking stack tied up to this, where you can start servers like HTTP servers that are programmatically controlled entirely in the browser security sandbox, right? And so for things like that, like that's, that's more on the operating system side. How do we actually create a TCP networking stack that maps to, virtualized TCP networking stack that maps to the, the, the service worker API, right? And so for those, we're, you know, we're kind of tied the core node internals there to, again, operating system interfaces that you would get on a POSIX sort of system, right? Mm -hmm. All right. LibUV provides, right, nodes event loop, but it also provides system calls. So you could use the leverage of the browser's event loop. But what about those system calls then? I assume this is where this kind of WebAssembly operating system comes in. Yeah. Because you need like a virtual file system to talk to, you need to be able to make system calls somehow. Can you tell us about that? What is this operating system? Like, what can it do? Like, where'd it come from? <laughs> yeah, so you know, there's been a lot of like, you know, kind of like getting an OS to run in a browser is not necessarily a new thing. Like, you know, this is kind of one of the main demos that, you know, like ASMJS back in the day is like they got like Linux running and, you know, as a JavaScript file or whatever, right? So that the problem with cross compiling an actual Linux OS is that these things are just dog slow when you put them in a browser. And for Stackblitz, right, the key guiding principle for our product experience is that it's got to be fast. And our goal is always, it has to be faster than local. If we're telling developers, hey, you should do development in a browser. It's got to be a better environment. That means faster. And so this was a really key part of the challenge that we had to figure out. And, you know, we took a couple of different stabs at this, but we all ultimately sat down and like, we, we've got to bite the bullet. If we want the speed that we're looking for and the, the, and the very light payload size, this thing clocks in like under a megabyte, we're going to have to do this from scratch and write this thing using Rust. So it compiles out to be pretty optimal size for a WebAssembly module. And we're gonna to have to identify the things that developer environments rely on and really do a first principles ground up approach here. It took literally years, <laughs> but that's the short of it. But it, it's a, a thousand iterations that it took to kind of figure out what are all the POSIX sort of interfaces that Node.js requires that not even that, when you look at developer repos, what are they relying on? What are the third-party packages doing, right? It's like part of it is just Node.js itself. And then, you know, the ecosystem does a whole bunch of, I can tell you, a whole bunch of crazy stuff. So testing across all of that has just been, in, you know, two years of trial and error, essentially. What up, party people? If you want to know what's happening with your code, track errors, and monitor your app's performance with Sentry, build better software faster with Sentry's application monitoring platform, 
diagnose, fix, and optimize the performance of your code. Cut your time on error resolution from hours to minutes. It works with any language and integrates with dozens of services. Over 1 million developers and 68,000 organizations already use Sentry. And best of all, GS Party listeners new to Sentry get the team plan for free for three months. Head to Sentry.io to get started and use the code PARTYTIME when you sign up. Again, Sentry.io and use the code PARTYTIME because, hey, it's party time, y'all. Zoom out and back up. I'm sure we can get right back into the weeds here soon. And I appreciate the weeds as much as anybody does. So I'm not trying to, uh, <laughs> but why would you want to do this? So let's answer that question. Because running Node in the browser, why? Like, what does that unlock? Tell us what it unlocks today. Maybe we can dream a little bit. Some of us get great ideas immediately. Like, oh, I can do this. And I couldn't do that before. Others sit here and like, well, I don't even know why that's cool. I mean, a lot of sounds like a lot of work. Sounds like you guys have been working hard on it, but why? Why, why do this? Yeah, there's a handful of benefits, right? I think for StackBlitz, what was the, be the key insight that led my co-founder and I to, to start the company was that, you know, browsers are like really powerful. They've got, they're like way more powerful than I think anyone, anyone has realized. So like, you know, four years ago, the first version of StackBlitz, which, you know, is still online today, it was this custom version of Webpack you could run in a browser. And what was really nice about that is that browsers are a very consistent environment. So if I want to create a bug reproduction, send it to someone you can instantly have these things online, right? But it allows you to actually merge, kind of like what I was talking about before with like VA coming out of the browser with Node and then bring it back in. We can actually leverage the, all the amazing built-in stuff in our browser to have a much better development and debugging experience, right? The key examples in like the blog post, right, is, you know, like when you run a Next.js tool chain in StackBlitz versus on local, if you, with the advent of server-side rendering, you need to be able to debug what's going on on your server side. And debugging with Node.js is, it's not impossible, but it's like, it's, it's not as, as easy as, as, you know, popping up Chrome DevTools and just hitting the debugger, right? With Stackblitz, it's now possible to do that. You can actually, as you know, one of the demo videos we got is, right, is like you can have a live API endpoint. When you go to the server, if there's a debugger statement, it'll actually stop the request from responding. You can step through the debugger and do your thing. And that requires no installations on your computer, no extensions, whatever, Right. So like it's essentially taking the best of what browsers allow us to do for front end development and now applying it to this like this full stack sort of world that we're moving towards with things. I mean, like the jam sack sort of space and like what Vercel is doing with Next.js. Right. And of course, it's ridiculously fast because you're not paying the multi-process overhead that you would on a local computer when you're spinning up all these copies of V8 and whatever have you. Right. So it's actually faster than your local machine to do your development builds and even production builds now. Yeah, that's cool. And uh, some of the other things you go into is potentially in a world where this thing was prevalent and available and existent, you could have, for example, multiple branches side by side in two different tabs and like the full code plus development environment in tab one on this branch and the full code plus development environment in branch two in that tab. Yeah. And just have those be isolated sandbox things that you can flip back and forth between without any sort of setup or environment isolation on local host. So that's a really cool idea. It seems like a lot of these things are really dev oriented in terms of like, is Node in the browser mostly about improving the development environment or are there actually production implications of like, once you send your code into the world, are you gonna be shipping Node into the browser to your end users as well, or just when you're developing things? Yeah, I think to start, like we're pretty focused on the development aspects because the benefits are pretty immense for like for the reasons you outlined, right? Setting up local environments is a pain for experienced dev uh, and a, a huge barrier to entry for people who are entering the market, right? And so it's, you know, being able to have this stuff open in a tab. I mean, companies spend like weeks having developers get onboarded to like a code base, right? It's like the idea of being able to like crack open a browser tab and be able to like commit code on your first day at a giant Fortune 100 company is, is like pretty wild, right? But I think that, you know, there's an interesting future here though that you're pointing out is like, well, and this is kind of what the Chrome team is like doing or the Vugu initiative, right? Like can web apps 
replace desktop apps that are currently using Electron? And the answer is increasingly becoming like, yeah, they can. But they do lack right now some of the APIs and developer experience that you would need for some of these things. And so we're kind of interested in seeing, like, could this be something that other developers could use to ship desktop grade applications in a browser, right? Um, I think you mentioned uh, experimental file system API, or so, uh, maybe that was just yeah. in some sort of press release or something. But um, that seems like it would open up, instead of talking to a, a virtual OS, you could actually talk to the user's file system. Of course, there are a ton of security implications there, and it's probably a minefield, and there's probably a lot of people that don't want browsers to do that sort of thing. But there you go. It seems like you could use something like this and... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and that API, maybe to some people's dismay, is actually shipped stable in Edge and Chrome right now, right? So like, you know, web apps, they can actually request. And like, you go to stackwits.com slash local, you can like try this out for yourself in Edge or Chrome, that is. And it's exactly that, right? Where it's wild. You're giving the Stackwits web app read and write access to a PC or file system, like your like a, a Next.js app you're working on or whatever. And you could not have NPM or Node or Git installed on your computer at all. But it would be running locally on using your CPU, NPM, Node, and Git inside of StackBlitz, inside of the browser security sandbox now, right? That's pretty wild. You know, like you don't have to have anything installed, but you can be having read and write access to your actual file system. For us, that's been a key thing that we've been really waiting on for them to ship stable because oftentimes you will have things installed. You do need to run things that will only run in your local environment, but the file system can act as really the bridge between an online quote unquote IDE versus, you know, something you have to run locally now, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think over the next five years, I think we're going to see a lot of desktop apps turning into desktop PWAs because they install instantly. They can do everything you would need to, right? An Electron app would and et cetera, et cetera, you know? So today, could I open up StackBlitz and then like find a working copy on my machine and ask StackBlitz to open it, edit some files, save them, and then go back into my terminal outside of StackBlitz and like commit those changes? Could I do that? Yeah. You go to stackbits.com slash local. You can open up from your local machine. That said, it's like, you know, it's buggy largely because we just got, you know, kinks to work out. But, you know, by the end of the summer, if not sooner, like that's kind of our target is that there's zero reason why this can't be a desktop grade ID where you do exactly what you described, where you mount the folder, you can use it just like you would use VS Code to make the changes. And you can use it even just as an editor. You don't have to run commands in Stackless if you don't want, right? But you can use it literally as an editor. And then on your local machine, pull up your terminal and commit the changes that you saved from Stackless to the FS, you know, and then commit it to Git or whatever. So there's something that's been, this is back to an earlier part of our conversation, but something that's been chewing away in my head, which is around versioning. So if I understand right now, you're teasing apart the JavaScript interpreter V8, now using the browser's version of that, and you're implementing some version of all of the other different Node APIs, do you ever run into version inconsistencies? Like places where the, I'm not super familiar with Node internals, but I would assume that if they're interacting with V8, they're making assumptions about this version of V8 and they're testing with a particular version of V8. And if you unlock that, suddenly you're in the browser and you could be with whatever version of V8. Evergreen. Evergreen version of V8, right? Well, Evergreen is great, but like when they do browser stuff, they're testing with a single self-consistent version. It's not like they're separately evolving pieces. They're shipping every six weeks, right? And they have a test cycle. Is so Node pinned to specific versions? Is that something that we know? I mean, you probably know, but I don't know. Does it get pinned like at a release date? Like this version of Node speaks to this version of V8. Yeah, yeah, because Node bundles its own, just like Electron bundles its own copy of Chrome and, and therefore right. V8. It, it, you know, Node.js bundles its own copy of V8, right? So it's kind of a static, you know, snapshot. But the thing is, and so like, it's a great question, right? Because it's less of a problem than you might imagine, but there are interesting ramifications that will, you know, as we go forward here, we'll have to, you know, to solve for, right? Because it's less of that there'll be backwards, because, you know, the whole idea of browsers is that, you know, Google still has test cases from like 1995 or whatever, right? Okay, they're not that far, but like, you know, 2005 or something. They test all these different things and make sure that they still work, right? And that's a key design requirement for browser vendors is that they don't break backwards compatibility, right? But they do introduce new functionality, right? They do introduce top level of weight. They do introduce that. And so, so what you could end up happening, right, is if you're using a newer copy of V8 than Node 10 does, the user could write code in a web container that would run, 
But if you brought it to local, it wouldn't because they're using a very outdated version of V8, right? Because unfortunately, it is a, it is a design flaw in our view. It's a design flaw that we're bundling a copy of V8 that goes out of date the day after. There's a nightly that's newer the day after that, that these things get released, right? It should be evergreen. Why do we want to do snapshot browsers? The same thing, like, why can't we take what is great about web browsers, which is that they are constantly adding capabilities, but do a really good job of supporting backwards compatible code, you know, that was written 20 years ago or whatever, right? So I think this is kind of like the merger of those two worlds in our view. That said, you know, I think it's a year or two from now, as code is getting executed, it's like, I think the big question is, hey, async await doesn't work in node 12, right? So, or whatever. You know, so like we have to like make sure that that code throws an error for the user or something like that. But those are kind of the main things that you have to be conscious of. Yeah, they also ship progressions occasionally and things like that, right? Like I know don't break the web is a wonderful concept, but one of the nice things about server side is like if you lock down your environment, you can absolutely test things and know it's going to work. And you mentioned that like the browser is less variable of an environment. I think that's true rather than shipping desktop software, but it's blatantly false when it comes to shipping like application software, right? We can completely control and lock down our application server environment. Right. And we cannot do that in the browser. So I'm trying to wrap my head around this because I'm, I'm thinking about like, this is an interesting model for deploying software, but it feels like it actually walks in between those lines of things that we used to have locked down or able to be locked down, even if not everyone was locking it down and stuff that's going to be like breaking in this environment versus that one. What version of Chrome are you on? Are you using Firefox and you have a completely different JavaScript interpreter? Like, how are you, how are we doing this? Well, it's Chrome only. Yeah, totally. Right. Well, it, 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 That it, solves it, that problem. It, <laughs> <laughs> it runs today in Firefox. There's a couple of bugs with, uh, yeah, yeah. Small. I mean, we don't have it available publicly just because there's bugs that we got to work through on the thing. But we built this on web standard API. So in Safari, doing their best to ship WebAssembly. Three. One of these years. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, like, I, enough said, I guess, on that end, right? But, like, this stuff is standardized, so it looks like they might ship it in the next six months, maybe, you know, like WebAssembly threads and that sort of thing. But, you know, the point stands of, like, you can take, because, like, we have Stackblitz has, like, a, you know, we're a business, and the way we make money is we actually sell an enterprise version of Stackblitz. You can run it behind a firewall, right? Which, when you talk to Fortune 100 companies that are doing literally trillions of dollars in transaction volume, they will not use AWS, right? They can't afford to. They have to have their own data centers, right? Where they're running this stuff. And the benefit that they see from this approach, it's a double-edged sword. Yes, you can lock down your environment, which is how we deploy our cloud native software behind their firewall. But the reason they want StackBlitz being able to utilize the browser is because it solves a ridiculous number of security issues. You can create a container that's going to work the same everywhere. But if you're using part of that container as code, it can be infected. You're opening your company up to supply chain attacks that are on the rise, right? And so that's the double-edged sword here is do we want to live in a world, right? And it's an individual basis, right? Like, you know, for Fortune 100 companies, the answer, you know, they'll take security every day of the week, right? Yeah, virtualization with WebAssembly gives you some very clear security wins. I do wonder about, like, you could potentially get that by shipping a WebAssembly runtime that is not running in the browser and doesn't have these same sort of mismatch version issues, right? You just lock it down, ship node, some version of WebAssembly runtime. But you're relying on the implementer. You're relying on whatever is bridging out to your you know, local machine for that WebAssembly interface. You're relying on that implementer to not have any vulnerabilities in their code base. Same as the browser, right? We're relying on the browser. Hey, bingo. But Fortune 100 companies, everyone has approved Google Chrome as a browser. It is Fortune 100 companies. They have, they have allowed a runtime explicitly for, their, for everyone at the company to use that they trust security-wise, because if, if for a good reason. Google's got 15,000 cores right now while we're sitting fuzzing that code base 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they've got the zero day team. This company is leading the web security industry. They take this stuff seriously. And so if you're going to say, hey, we're going to introduce a WebAssembly runtime that's more local-based, right, which I have no doubt one will pop up, right? But if I were going to bet money, I think it's going to probably be based on all of the work that Google does from a security standpoint for the exact reason that Cloudflare uses V8 for Cloudflare workers. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I might actually see us pulling out, you know, the WebAssembly runtime from Chrome. Yeah, it, totally. It's a different set of trade-offs, but yeah, it's, it is an interesting... 
I'm not disillusioned in thinking that this is, you know, the world software is, is all going to run on this stuff overnight. But I, I think the benefits are pretty enormous. I mean, certainly from a security angle, but also from a speed angle, because V8 isolates are incredibly fast compared to local operating system processes. They're much more secure and very fast for context switching. And so like with web container, that's interesting. Your Node.js applications run 20% faster than they would on local. So even as a developer, you were kind of marrying like security and productivity. Normally you only get to pick one of these things, but but when you use stack blitz, right? You're, you are more productive, your builds finish faster, you can code faster and build faster, and it's far more secure, right? That's the interesting part for me because I've seen a lot of these things come and go, put your development environment in the browser, uh, I remember back when Heroku was actually that. Before Heroku was successful, their first version was, hey, it's an IDE in the browser. Isn't this cool? So it was a complete Ruby on Rails environment in your browser. And it was really impressive, and nobody wanted to use it because it was <laughs> the uncanny valley, and it was slower than localhost, and you ran into issues, and you couldn't pop your terminal and just do a terminal command and then hop back into your... It just never has worked. And so if you are able to pull this off because of the speed... You know, if it delivers on the speed promises, which we see in the demos and the GIFs, if that works out in practice, you know, I think you'll have a compelling environment, whereas nothing has convinced me ever that I should put my development environment in my browser to date. Absolutely. Yeah. It's kind of like we've seen over the years, like web ID after web ID, and they all are just like not as good as a local environment. Right. And so I think, you know, this seems like a... a solving one of those problems for sure that's stopping people from using it. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head too, because that's kind of been our viewpoint from day one is that why would you move to an online IDE if it's not going to be better than your local environment, right? It can't be as good even, right? It has to be better. Otherwise, what's the incentive? And then when you break that down, what do we care about as developers? How fast can I do? How fast can I get my ideas into my fingertips through the keyboard and get a response back from the computer? It's speed. Right? How fast can I get a response from the computer? And and also, you know, again, with the supply chain attacks increasing for people who are employed at large organizations that have a lot to lose, how can this give me a, a secure by default guarantee? Right? And it runs consistently. You know, I think is that, you know, oh, that works on my machine issue, right? Like that's, you know, I think those are the key things to us at least that really matter for this to work. And by the way, you can try this out. You don't even have to be logged in because the beautiful thing is that you can go to stapus.com, click the next JS starter project. You don't have to log in because it doesn't cost us anything to run. Like I think our servers cost, you know, less than a thousand bucks a month. And we've got, uh, you know, two, three million developers that are, that are using the product, right? Because it's all leveraging your local CPU and memory. So you can try it out for yourself to see just kind of how fast it is. Changelog News is the best way to keep up with the fast-moving software world. We track, log, and contextualize the coolest projects, the best practices, and the biggest stories each and every week. Make changelog.com your daily destination or hit the snooze button and subscribe to our weekly newsletter that hits inboxes on Sunday mornings. Join more than 15,000 enthusiastic readers. It'll cost you exactly $0. And you can subscribe right now at changelog.com slash weekly. I'd love to dig in a little bit more on why it's faster. You've sort of mentioned a couple times that it is faster and you have demos that show that. And I was thinking about this and I was like, okay, there's a few different angles and I'd be curious to think of. So one possibility that I was thinking about is like you've essentially moved all the stuff that lived in the kernel into user space and you probably simplified the set of things it has to handle. So by virtue of not dipping down into kernel space, you don't have any sort of like process changing or anything. And so that piece could be faster. And then the other piece I was thinking about is you're mostly simulating web stuff. So you could probably shortcut the network connection. So like what would be a local host connection that's going through exactly. your local network device and HTTP and all those other things, you could probably put shortcuts in. And then there might be other things that I haven't even thought of. So I'm curious, what is it that's making it so fast? I'm guessing that's the big win is the networking stuff. Go ahead, tell us. Yeah, no, it's a really good question. I mean, this is like, we spend a lot of time working on speed because I, like I said, it's like, this is kind of like what, you know, 
from a product perspective, this is the number one thing. Like, you know, what is Stackblitz? It's fast, right? Like whatever we're they are fast. And that's because that's, again, how it can be better than your local environment. If it's faster, faster is better, right? So there's a kind of a, an array of things that kind of play into this and work in concert with one another for this kind of seamless experience. But like, I think to start off, it's something I mentioned before was V8 isolates. So the idea of not having to spin up multiple literal operating system processes, right? For every Node.js thread you want to run or whatever, right? On local, that actually there is an overhead to doing that. But in your browser, right? When you open up a browser tab, you need the ability to have, you know, multiple web workers and, you know, different like processes, right? But it has to be really fast. Browsers have to be really fast. And so V8 isolates and in the other browsers, they have kind of different terminologies for this, but essentially it's it's the equivalent of a single you know, kind of unique process, more or less, that that's running in your browser. And by being able to have one copy of V8 doing that for all of your Node.js processes, the editor that you're editing in, and the, the web apps that, you know, like when you open up the URL to view your dev server, there's an incredible amount of overhead that's cut there, right? Because you're on, on your computer, that's actually one operating system process. Every Chrome tab gets its own process, Right. And we virtualized essentially the normal would normally be dozens of different processes into that same process shared via V8 isolates, which are super fast, super secure for context switching, right? So high level, there's that. I can go on to the next point, but if we want to talk more about that stuff, we can we can dig in a little bit. But under the hood, that's kind of the bedrock, right, of what makes this fast. Second thing, right, is exactly what you said. So when you're for at least for your dev server, right, you might have noticed like you know, on local, when you, when you run a Webpack dev server build of any meaningful app, the dev builds are like megabytes in size. And so if you've ever used like GitHub code spaces or code sandbox or anything like this, right, they're running it on a remote VM. And what that means is that when, when they crack open the server for you to, you know, Webpack dev server, when the port opens, you can connect to it or whatever, they're proxying you to that server and you're pulling down megabytes of, you know, non-minified dev builds. It's super slow. It takes forever, Right. Because this doesn't leave the Chrome security sandbox, i.e. using one copy of V8, right? Those responses from the server go through the service worker API and hit faster than you can even hit a local host URL. And so when you're talking about web development, that's a pretty big win, right? How fast can I see a hot reload happen? How fast can I refresh to see the latest change? With web containers, you're talking about, you know, less than, you know, 15 milliseconds or something, right? To, to actually see it start rendering. Let's see. I think those are some of the key things there. And then I think on what you mentioned around the operating system and, you know, kind of like having be coupled, did a ton of stuff there. So I think you, you actually did a great job explaining that those optimizations. But the other side of it is the NPM side, right? So NPM normally takes forever to, you know, complete an install. And so this is something when we built Stackless V1, we built the, you know, like the first NPM client that would work in a browser and was like, you know, five times faster than, than Yarn and NPM. And in the first version, you know, the real, the key trick was being able to have a file system that could be lazy loadable from network. Cause essentially you don't have to download like, you know, a gigabyte of node modules. You can actually be really smart about what are the files that are going to get, you know, used from node, node modules, only download that. And browsers just have gotten really good at just downloading, you know, they're doing, you know, hundreds or thousands of requests for actually really large payloads at this point. And they have great built-in caching mechanisms. So on every page load, actually, we run a fresh NPM install every single time, right? So if something goes wrong with your environment, again, if you look at the other players in the market, like code spaces or whatever, if something goes wrong and you hit the refresh button, it's reconnecting you to that broken container again, right? Unlike every other web app, where if something goes wrong with Google Docs, you hit refresh, usually it like works again, right? With Stackwitz, now the same thing is true because if something goes wrong with your environment, you just hit refresh, it rebuilds the, the container from the ground up because it takes only a couple of seconds. So you're guaranteed a fresh environment every single time, right? And so it kind of relies on this custom NPM technology we've made. And again, browsers are, you know, they have first class networking built into them, right? So we're able to leverage that in a way that, you know, would be difficult to do on local. That's fascinating. So you're redoing an NPM install, but it's essentially hitting the browser cache so that they're coming from a, a locally cached version of those packages. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to get in the weeds a little bit. So how do you handle packages from NPM that have like a post install step, maybe a build or something that they run immediately after you NPM install them? Yeah, it's an anti-pattern. So five years ago, Sam Saccone filed a vulnerability that NPM has yet to address where essentially the execution of post-install scripts by default on every install you do 
can enable a very, very, very bad type of worm to propagate. Whereas it kind of goes essentially like this open source developer, you know, gets a bug report and someone says, Hey, here's the repo you can download and install to, to reproduce the bug. Except that person who's filed the bug report, put a worm in the post install script. What it does is scans the current logged in NPM user on that computer, looks at all the open source packages that they have published and then republishes minor versions to include that post install script with the code that, that infected them in the first place. Then that gets published. Other people download from this open source, you know, authors, popular libraries, rinse and repeat. And this worm has gone across the entire NPM ecosystem, stealing credentials, wreaking havoc, right? This has been unaddressed by NPM. I don't know why, but nonetheless, it's a huge issue. And again, when you talk about Fortune 100 companies, what happened with SolarWinds? What is going on with this stuff? It's developers are the weakest link in security now because we're running NPM install and there's thousands of things we're installing that we're not even necessarily aware of, right? And so these people have security teams, but these things can slip in. So by removing post install as a default thing that happens, it eliminate this attack surface, right? And you can introduce ways where you say, hey, run this specific command where the user has to take intent to do an action, right? A lot of the time too, these post install scripts are, you know, downloading, compiling, and running binaries, which, you know, is not great from a security perspective necessarily, right? But, you know, with with kind of the transition that we're seeing, right, you know, I think the industry is seeing, there's a lot of things that should be WebAssembly modules. Like if you look at what Next.js is doing, they swapped their sharp image optimization to a WebAssembly variant because it's faster, it's more secure, right? There's a lot of binaries that that shouldn't be binaries. They should be WebAssembly binaries because they run everywhere. They require no post install script. They're directly inspectable. You know, there's a lot of benefit. Like I think five, 10 years ago when net, you know, the NPM ecosystem came up, sure. Yeah, this the WebAssembly didn't exist. Different world today. And lots of attacks happening. You know, it's a different world than in a world that actually needs a more secure binary runtime format like WebAssembly, right? So anyways, off my soapbox. (laughs) So I'm not going to argue whether or not they are an anti-pattern, but my understanding is they are still supported by NPM. So how does that work in a stack blitz world? We we don't run. We don't. And and if if we find packages that, that have a post install script, we say, hey, we don't run this. For your security, you can learn more about it here. Or if you want to run the script yourself, you can you can do that. This is a, an important thing for 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 the ecosystem as a whole to take seriously, right? And it might sound like we're being like ridiculous about this, but if slash when this happens, right? Which Sam Sacconi has gone on the record going, it is a matter of time until someone does this, right? You know, it's a matter of time. We got We need to take stuff like this seriously. I think that the the Node ecosystem. I think it's getting to a point where we, we security has got to be a first class consideration with with how we're building our software, right? And actually, just across the entire software industry, we are the weakest link. We got to take it seriously. I mean, uh, regarding the worm, since it's been brought up a couple times, NPM didn't introduce two factor authentication, which, as you're describing, it would be exceedingly difficult to for a worm to propagate if it had to put in the one-time password to publish something. But, I mean, it seems fair to me if the companies and the, you know, if the intended audience for this this tool prioritizes security to, you know, kind of essentially disallow scripts on install. If they don't want them to happen, then great. And yeah, I agree. A lot of things should be WebAssembly modules, right? But say that you do want to use something that, I don't know, it needs to grab a binary. God forbid it needs to compile something. What happens? Like, can your OS compile things? Like, what can it do in, you know, in terms of, like, is, is Bash running? Like, how does that work? <laughs> yeah, we've got a, uh, uh, you know, kind of a slimmed down uh, you know, shell, right? So I think pretty soon you'll be able to actually, like, you know, execute kind of Bash scripts in the thing. But, you know, I think that there's some stuff going on where you could actually compile, you know, tool chains and binaries, whatever, in the browser itself, for sure. I mean, I think the work that the WASI folks are doing, right, is kind of paving the way for this future to, to happen. I think that we're kind of betting on a larger trend, right, which is the world is going to move their software more towards web-based computing, like WebAssembly. And if that's the case, then yes, you're going to end up with WebAssembly modules that compile Python into other WebAssembly modules or whatever, right? And this stuff's already starting to happen. That strikes us as, as the right way to do this. 
you know, using a secure by default, you know, runtime to produce more secure by default, you know, binaries for runtimes or whatever, right? But yeah, I, I mean, I, and to answer the direct question, like what happens if you, if you need to like compile a, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, like a JVM or something, you know, if you try and download, yeah, it's, it's not going to work, right? Unless it's, you know, using a WebAssembly module to do the actual compilation work, of course. But, but yeah, it's a feature that it can't in a sense. Mm -hmm. So let's tease apart, or we're running a little bit low on time here. Before we go, I definitely want to tease apart web containers versus stack blitz. The announcement, the new tech is web containers. There's a GitHub repository. There's a working group. There's things that look very open and collaborative. StackBlitz, like you said, you're a business. You can run Node.js in your browser on stackblitz.com, but like, can you run it in your browser? Other places. So what's the collaboration and the open story here? Is there one? And how do we differentiate between what's StackBlitz proprietary tech and what's out there to be used by everybody kind of stuff? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I think right now, so we're, you know, this this stuff is very new and 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 we're still figuring out a lot of it ourselves. And so that's why we're we're in an open beta for people to try it out and kind of push the limits of it because uh, there's still there's still a bit more that we need to learn about how to make something like this very runtime compatible and cross-platform compatible, et cetera. At the same time, kind of leading from what we were just talking about, we also need to get developers to think about how they're running their tool chains a little bit differently. And again, our pitch is it is faster and more secure to do it using WebAssembly based tool chains, right? Or, or you know, leveraging the you know billions of dollars getting poured into browser innovation, right? But in order to do that, we need to make sure that it's seamless because it's a key design goal. If you go to like our web container working group repo, one of our key design goals is that this should not be something that requires you to change how your code base is set up to, to work. It should just, you know, quote unquote, just work, right? So that means we got to, there are certain packages that are not available as WebAssembly modules. So we got to flip those over, right? As a community, kind of a host of other things. But as far as like, you know, what is the... Today, where the community is really helping is, is helping those larger shifts happen. There's just a ton of people who are, who are doing this now, which is so awesome to see. And also giving us feedback on the core runtime and helping us battle test it. Because what we're tracking towards is like, you know, a general availability release, you know, sometime, you know, end of the summer or fall or something like that. And we want to expose, you know, like enable developers to use this thing, you know, with like, you know, a really like great API surface and perhaps introduce standards, like actually introduce standards where, there are currently gaps in what, you know, browser vendors are doing or WASI or whatever, right? We're still, we're trying to get a bit of a, a lay of the land to understand exactly, you know, how we need to go about solving these problems in a way where everyone can leverage, you know, the, the power that's in their browser to ship better, faster, more secure applications, right? So that's that's kind of the, the long-winded version of it. I guess what I don't understand is like, is there a portion of this that is open source or... Is it all proprietary or how does that work? Yeah, so today everything is, is you know, largely closed source. Our intention is that this is going to be a ever receding closed core, right? Kind of like if you look at what like React Native did, they did not have it publicly available for a very long time as they were hammering out a lot of the core issues. That's kind of how we view this. And I think the NPM client thing is a great example of that. Like we've got you know, the fastest, you know, most secure NPM client running in this thing. And, and there's there's no reason we shouldn't release that as open source for people to use in their local environments as well, right? I think like over the course of the next year, a lot of the things that you're seeing in this, as we stabilize them, it's not even just going to be applicable inside of Stacklets. It's going to start hitting people in their local environments as well, right? That's our intention. But in order to do that, we have to make sure that it's a, a very seamless experience for the person who's going to adopt this thing and make sure that it's not going to cause them, you know, a huge migration effort or, you know, or it's going to break or whatever have you. So that's like very valuable. What we're doing right now is getting a lot of test data in lightweight environments because people aren't trying to use this for, you know, work that is tied to their actual job or something right now. Right. So we want to make sure that we're pretty confident before we start, you know, rolling this out for people to rely on for their jobs, for the livelihood, you know. Something you said about getting this available to everyone made me wonder is there a plan for supporting other backend languages? And I think there's an interesting question there around the performance benefits because you know, what were they called? Instantiations or whatever it is like that benefits not going to be there. You are going to be virtualizing some sort of runtime or something into WebAssembly. but some of the performance benefits you've talked about could very well generalize, right? Like the idea of package installation and utilizing 
the browser cache, the idea of cutting out the network stack and being able to directly access things. Like, does it make sense to have web containers for running Python on WebAssembly, Golang on WebAssembly? I mean, Rust already kind of goes straight to WebAssembly, but like, does it make sense to expand this beyond Node? That's our goal, right? For sure, right? Like, like we think that that's absolutely how it should work, that you should, like, you know, today JavaScript is the easiest language, you know, certainly the most sensible one. If anyone's going to understand the value of an online IDE, it should be web developers, right? Like, you know, we should be able to build the web using the web. But, you know, if you kind of look beyond that, yeah, the same benefits can absolutely apply to other languages. And so I think that's the longer term view here. And and what's going to be the hardest part and why we've put together a working group to start thinking about these problems, because you've also got the WebAssembly standard interface, the, the WASI folks who are helping, trying to help bridge this gap, right? Because WebAssembly is great, but it does not specify how you access a file system or you know, TCP networking or whatever, right? Really important APIs for most binaries to be converted to a WebAssembly module. And they're doing a phenomenal job on that. And So Stackblitz is going to have like a WASI standardized interface available to developers, you know, in the next month or two here, you'll be able to actually, you know, run Python or et cetera. And and to start, it's going to be, you'll be running the Python REPL or something like that, right? Because there's going to be, again, as an industry, we're going to have to make some structural changes to, you know, enable the, you know, ease of adoption and performance and et cetera that you'd want in order for this to be a viable switch from your local environment. But we want to apply momentum in that direction because that's that totally right. Like that, that just seems like the future. It seems like a better future at least. Super cool stuff, Eric. See, we're all excited now. Even Chris is excited. We're all excited. You've done a good job fielding our questions. I'm sure a couple of fun. head nods, <laughs> <laughs> the small ones, but hey, I saw cool stuff. No. Yeah. So hey, I saw a smile from Chris. That's like, well done, sir. <laughs> well done. <laughs> You've the first <laughs> These are really test. good questions, by the way. These are like very on, like, on the nuts and bolts of exactly, you know, what's going on here. So um, I really appreciate having me on. This, is, this has been a lot of fun. You bet. The listeners, all the links to all the things, including that uh, introductory blog post and places where you can go to watch the demos for yourself. And do you watch a demo? No, you try a demo. Go try the demo. See how you can get it running in your browser. Chrome and maybe Firefox here soon. It'll be exciting, Eric, to watch you guys make progress. Like you said, this is early days. This is announcement. This is excitement gathering, but there's a lot of work left to do. So we'd love to catch up with you maybe in six months to a year and see how far y'all have made it and what is out there to be used and advanced from there. So thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. Chris and Cable, awesome as always to have you here with us. And uh, that's our show. We'll talk to y'all next week. Thank you for listening to JS Party. If this is your first time with us, subscribe now at jsparty.fm or in your favorite podcast app. Just search for JS Party, you'll find us. And if you enjoy the show, please send it to a friend or a colleague who might also benefit from it. We'd really appreciate it. JS Party is produced by Jared Santo with music by Breakmaster Cylinder. We are brought to you by Fastly, Launch Darkly, and Linode. Next up on the pod... Nick sits down with Tanner Lindsley to discuss React Query and the TAN stack. That episode will be ready to put in your ear holes next week.